Dr. Lenny Time is going to be pre presenting tonight, and uh, I want to say, just, just mention, you've seen it on the flyer probably, but just as to repeat, he has a PhD in or inorganic chemistry from Oregon State University. He has a BA in chemistry from Washington and Jefferson College, and he has a, a postdoctoral doc in bio inorganic mimicry, mimicry from Brandeis University slash Western Virginia University, if I'm getting it correct. Yeah, the guy was working for a move from Brandeis to West Virginia University while I was there, so I got a free trip. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, uh, Dr. Lenny Time has been in the area in Oregon. He came back from wherever else he was, about 1990, and he's, he has, he's trying to understand exactly uh, what he's doing earlier. I just, I don't want to misquote uh, him, but I want to say that it's, his heart seems to be in improving, to say the least, uh, how we do natural resource management, if I could, you know, really broad statement. And, um, He's actually been in the Ashland area now, uh, in and out, now he's back. And uh, he is um, giving his technical expertise to different, different groups, I believe. So without delay, here is Dr. Lenny Time. And again, he's speaking on heavy metal contamination, global warming, and mitigating the harm. Yes. Connection to natural resources comes from a real curiosity. I got into chemistry because it was a difficult topic and most of the other things I was dealing with were kind of easy. And I never understood how metals actually worked their way through the ecosystems. And you know where metals are found, they're deposits from the earth for the most part. And when you get to mining a metal deposit, it usually is in a cluster made up of primarily cations and anions of a single metal type constructed in a lattice formation so that it fall, forms salts. And they mine the salts, refine the salts, reduce the salt into metal, and dispense with the byproducts. So there's very few metals that you find in nature that you find as metals. You don't find chunks of iron laying in the ground or big rocks made of total 100% nickel or uranium or anything. You do find mercury as mercury coming out of the ground. And a friend of mine in Eastern Oregon who had a mercury mine on his property was visited by the EPA and told to cease and desist and close his mine, which he wasn't really mining, it was just a natural formation. And it took him five years to clear up with the EPA that there was absolutely no way he was going to take the cost for a cleanup of a naturally occurring mercury mine on his property the way the EPA wanted him to do it. Fortunately, some bureaucrats saw the light. But the first part of this talk, I want to talk about two articles that came out in uh, Health Research News or a magazine that, uh, let me go back and I'll find out which magazine because it's not Health Research News, it's HFN, which is Health Freedom News. And the first article was written by our friend Dane Wigington. Everybody probably knows of Dane. He runs Geoengineering Watch, and he's one of the leading advocates for stopping the spraying. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to go through Dane's article and summarize it. And then after I go through Dane's article, I want to come back to the next article that was there that talked about the symptoms of global warming. 
and I want to talk about some of the symptoms of global warming and present the picture as we see it now and then we'll take a break and then coming back I'll tell you how I believe we can fix a lot of these problems from a personal basis starting with the people in the room. So Dane's article, Heavy Metal Contamination and Mass Extinction, is an attempt to link the spraying of the chemtrails with the sixth natural die-off that's happening right now. We have an extinction going on where a lot of species of plants, animals, crystals, mushroom, fungi, uh, different things are dying off. And people believe that technology can be the savior and that we can come up with some new means of fixing the problem. But I think we might be better served by not paying any attention to the controlled mass media and what they tell us are the solutions to the problems. Climate change for solar radiation management has put a slew of metal ions and other chemicals into the atmosphere. It's estimated that over 20 million metric tons of aluminum per year are sprayed into the atmosphere. And that number comes from David Keith, a noted geoengineer who goes out and says how great this geoengineering program is. But you have barium, you have strontium, you have other <coughs> inorganic ions, you have nanoparticles, you have different forms of different chemicals, molds, uh, endocrine disruptors, just Anything they, they want to put in there, it seems they're, they're spraying on us, fly ash. And when you think about it, it seems to me that this would be a very insidious way of using the commons to get rid of industrial waste. And that industrial waste is a major problem we have with all of the climate problems we have, with all of the earth metabolic problems that we have. So the trick is, we need to find a way of stopping the process of doing this. So Dane's article went into some depth about the association of the metals that are in the chemtrails with what they're doing on the ground. The last talk I gave in talent, I went through some of the mechanisms of how things work, and I explained that the aluminum ion was particularly insidious because aluminum carries a plus three charge and it goes into biological systems and it replaces elements that have a plus two charge. But in nature and in all natural chemistry systems, charge in has to equal charge out. And if you have a plus three replacing a plus two, the plus two's got to also have a plus one with it somewhere else. Plus twos are things like calcium, magnesium, and transition metal ions. Plus ones are things like sodium, potassium, and lithium. And you get the charge from the periodic table by losing the electrons in the outer shell of things that have outer shells where the electrons are far out. On the other hand, anions, where I just described cations, the anions pick up these extra electrons and fill an electron shell, and the idea of chemistry is just emptying or filling electron shells. Aluminum, because of the nature of creating a hole Somewhere in the system, because a plus three replaces a plus two and a plus one disappears from somewhere nearby to allow the charge to balance, those holes magnify. And when you get enough holes, you get things like Alzheimer's, BSE, mad cow disease, and several other things that we see all throughout nature which really seem to be caused by these heavy metal ions. When I say heavy metal, 
that's a rock and roll term, heavy metal. And it doesn't matter about the weight of the metal. The heaviness has to do with sort of like a chemical drag in the system. Aluminum's a fairly light metal in weight, but it's really insidious when it gets into biological systems. So what biological systems are being affected most? Well, the first one that we all notice are the bees. Has anybody heard of colony collapse disorder? Mm -hmm. sure. It's sort of like the latest thing. The bee populations are just not able to sustain their colonies, and a lot of this has to do with the aluminum levels that they're finding in the hives. In humans, three parts per million is enough aluminum in your system to cause autism. In these hives with the bees, they're finding 8 to 10 parts per million aluminum. So the bees being several orders of magnitude smaller than we are and facing a concentration of aluminum much higher than we face, it's no wonder they're having problems with this. Uh, not only are they having problems with the aluminum, but you've got the whole industry of farm chemistry, which is pesticides and herbicides dropped in huge volume on everything and indiscriminately taking out the good fauna and the bad fauna, them both. And on top of all that, there's genetically modified organisms. Now, I wasn't <coughs> planning on talking about GMOs, but you know, GMOs are greatly in the news because it seems like there's a lot of strong arming going on these days in Europe and that some of the trade agreements that are being negotiated now are going to force places that wouldn't accept the genetically modified organisms to start taking them. The biggest objection I have to GMOs is we haven't done our homework through the generations of how they're going to affect different progeny from the ones that we have. And all the rat studies that I've been looking at seem to imply that GMOs cause changes in the structures that are manifest two or three generations down the road. The other thing is a lot of the ge genetic engineering that's going on is specifically to breed either a resistance to a pesticide or herbicide or put a biological toxin into a system where it hasn't been in order to affect some other biological things. And the manifestations of what we know with how these things work lead to complications that we're just not ready to deal with. I personally think that the explanation that we've been given for genetics with two strands and four different things, an AT or a GC, that come together and pair up and this makes up all DNA in that, probably on a basic level is true. But things are a lot more complicated than that. And when you get into genetics and the way that genetics can change based on environment, I think we need to go back into the laboratories and spend a lot more time looking at what genetically modified organisms are. But that leads to a problem also <coughs> in that laboratories no longer do the type of science that I was trained to do when I was trained as a chemist. When I first started my training as a chemist, one of the things I had to do was take my equipment and repeat other people's published experiments and get similar answers to what they had to demonstrate that I knew how to use the equipment and could accomplish research that had already been demonstrated so that I can then go ahead and take my own ability and advance in the field. Nowadays, the cost of doing the research is huge with the price of instrumentation, but even more insidious, are the copyrights and patents and protections of intellectual property that let people own words that you can't use without paying a royalty 
or take concepts where they've gotten a patent and everyone else has been working on that concept has to drop it because some bureaucrat in an office said, oh, this is the first one in. But you know what? Albert Einstein was the bureaucrat in an office and he sat there reading all these papers and putting them all together for the good of society, not for the destruction that we see. Now Einstein once said you can't solve a problem in the mind frame that you were in when you caused, when the problem was generated. Remember that quote, that's going to be what helps us out of this whole situation once I'm done explaining how we got into it. Next system that has heavy metal poisoning that is very obvious today are the oceans. In 2010, they did a blood study that took over a thousand whales worldwide from different oceans on the planet and it showed stunningly high levels of heavy metals. The ocean itself is part of this geoengineering game with something they call ocean fertilization or metal seeding where they put iron and scatter it out into the water in order to start algae and plankton growing so that it picks up carbon dioxide and turns it into mass, algae and plankton. And when you start thinking about what's going on to do that, the initial thing that sounds like a good idea really isn't because the rapid growth involves metabolism which takes the carbon dioxide, binds it, kicks off oxygen, CO2, or oxygen, and uh, anyway, what you end up getting are you get places in the ocean where you have large amounts of mass and very little water flow, and other places where you have large amounts of water flow and very little mass. And so the ocean life is dealing with this seeding, it's dealing with the atmospheric chemical spraying, and it's dealing with radiation from Fukushima, which is an extinction level event which still hasn't really been dealt with, and also from uranium containing DU ordnance that has been scattered all over the planet courtesy of the military industrial complex and the war machine. So even if we could begin to attempt to clean things up, we've taken what initially were pockets of metal ores and we've created little bits of metal ions scattered all over our entire biology, biological system. The problems that we see with the ocean in addition to the metal ion concentration has to do with the rising temperatures. The atmospheric spraying programs have ended up destroying the ozone layer, although let's hold that statement in abeyance because later on I'm going to present some different information about ozone because I really question the story of the ozone layer and the ozone layer all. But I've learned to be skeptical of a lot of science that they have told us because the deeper you go, it's like peeling back an onion. You get to an onion and you get another round thing and you figure out what the surface looks like and you start peeling it and there's more onion skin under that onion skin. Okay, so the wind pattern changes have affected the currents. The currents right now are having real problems. I read an article recently on the thermohaline cycles, the ones that drive the ocean currents and move things around, and it turns out that we have done something to the thermohaline circuits, the currents, that hasn't been done it, well, they said the history of humanity, but I question those type of statements also. But apparently the Gulf oil spill ended up with a whole bunch of oil being sunk into the ocean, 
with the use of a chemical called Corexit. And when they sprayed the Corexit onto the oil, it created this mass that was heavy enough that it sunk. It took the oil off the surface and the problem went away in mass media viewpoint. <laughs> but in reality, what it did was it sunk this oil. Oil being a dispersant helped disperse the water that was part of the warm cycle of the current that would come down the Atlantic coast, hook into the Gulf of Mexico, spin around, and then shoot across the Atlantic somewhere parallel to central Brazil. Well, that current isn't flowing now. And so the circulation of waters around the globe has become stagnant and we just happen to be seeing some very, very strange weather patterns in the last two years. But this is Oregon and it rained this morning, so nothing different than anything else we've noticed. Um, there's also a problem that comes about due to the dead zones that's partially due to this lack of circulation but it's also due to the fact that we put enough raw sewage and pollutants into the rivers that by the time the rivers go into the oceans, each one of them is creating a plume of dead zone around where it's coming out so that we've got more and more places where the dead zone, the area where the oxygen is depleted and can't be mixed back in to support life within that zone, there's just more and more of those zones. So we've seen in the last year mass deaths of sea stars, red tuna crabs, and jellyfish, each in separate events. And that doesn't count algae brooms and other different marine die-offs that happen for other reasons, but the whole thing is leading to something called a Canfield Ocean a seascape marked by areas of total stagnation where nothing can actually move around. One more big factor from the oceans, and that is something like methane hydrates. In the polar regions of the world, ice being frozen for long times managed to accumulate methane from the anaerobic decomposition of organisms. By anaerobic, I mean under conditions where there's not enough oxygen, and so you get reduction chemistry happening instead of oxidation chemistry. The methane molecule would add to a water molecule, making what's called a methane hydrate, and it would keep the methane locked up in the ice, which remains spread out and essentially not in the atmosphere for a long time. Now that the poles are melting and we're starting to see quite a bit of more water taking the place of ice, what is happening is that the methane is being released into the atmosphere. There is not a terribly high concentration of methane relative to the carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere, but methane is about a hundred times more heat absorbing than carbon dioxide, so it's a much greater greenhouse gas effect. Methane is not stable in an oxidizing atmosphere like we have on Earth, and in 10 years it will be mostly oxidized. But at the levels that are due to be released, it's going to change the atmospheric chemistry. So this is not a good deal either. As long as the geoengineering is allowed to take industrial pollutants and scatter them across the earth in the, uh, with the idea that the solution to pollution is dilution, <laughs> remember when DuPont came up with that in the 60s, uh, then we'll be continually creating more environmental challenges than we're solving. If we each clean up our own act in our home region, we might be able to start turning the tide on a much larger basis. So first thing to do is to stop the behaviors 
that cause this sort of problem. And that's basically the gist of Dane's article. So he's pointing out how the metals themselves get into the biological system and by the fact that they are chemical catalysts, they change what's going to happen in the system and either accelerate the rate of growth or they consume one of the agents in the water that's needed for other agents to function. If all the oxygen in the patch of water is consumed, nothing that requires oxygen to live is going to be able to live in that batch of water. Okay, so that's scary article number one. Scary article number two by Hans Kugler, PhD, from the International Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, was about the science of global warming. And as a chemist, it has taken me a long time to actually tease out a lot of the scientific value from what they've been telling us and so much of the arguments on both sides of the global warming issue are non sequiturs. Uh, if you think about it, we know that the Earth is warming because we have measured the temperature in enough places and see the average increasing. We also know that the temperature on Mars, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter are all rising at the same rate that the temperature is rising on Earth, which tells me that we've got to stop those industrial civilizations on other planets. Um, the total amount of carbon dioxide released by burning carbon fuels and as a side product of the production of cement is 37 billion tons annually. Most of it from that production of cement. Now while nature has generally in the past always kept carbon dioxide levels below 300 parts per million, sometime last year we blew past 400 parts per million. And when you get up to 400 parts per million, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, now we're talking about more than we've had to deal with in our known existence. It might cause a little bit of problems. But the idea of 400 parts per million, well, think about it. What's 1% of a million? 100,000? Or is it 10? Anyway, at 400 parts per billion between 10,000 or 100,000, there's a long way to go. We're not talking about super high concentrations, but high enough to make an effect. Roughly 20 years ago, the panic generated warning claimed that the Tyndall effect was near. The Tyndall effect being a point of no return. And we had the time, this was under Carter administration, early Reagan years, that Carter had started working into alternative energy practices and inflation was going up at 20%, and everything was going haywire, but at least they were trying to look at the problem. Reagan came in, said, nah, there's no problem, took the solar panels out of the White House that Carter had just installed, and said, oh, just do what you want. Uh, rather than act, industry spent roughly half a billion dollars on public relations to deny that the problem existed or to confuse the public about what's happening. The IPCC, the international group from the UN that talks about climate change, claims that if we're going to deal with the problem, we're not allowed to take shortcuts because any shortcut taken in an interconnected biological system would just shift the problem. If you're going to solve the problem, you've got to solve the whole problem without short, 
shortcuts. If you do take a shortcut, well, then the problem gets worse. So what happens? Shortcut number one, geoengineering via chemtrails. So it's the only large-scale endeavor attempted in plain sight. Solar engineering management is basically the high-altitude spraying of matter in nanoparticulate form and other biological poisons to change the albedo of the Earth which is how much radiation is reflected by the atmosphere. The theory is that by throwing enough chaff into the air, you reflect the heat back out into space. Um, aluminum, barium, strontium, these are biological poisons, and they are also the wastes from industrial process. So the scientific voodoo of taking this shortcut has taken the cost of disposing of waste properly and created a lot more cost from that savings in the area of health of the population of the planet. Aluminum in particular is causing problems, not only the human problems, but things like reducing the ability of the trees to aspirate water completely throughout their system so that if you're in Northern California and you look at the tops of the trees, none of the tips of the trees are alive anymore. They're just not able to carry the water through the system all the way to the top of the tree. The aluminum is sprayed. We know about Alzheimer's. We know about autism. And we know about Monsanto and their aluminum-resistant genetic engineered plants. So, hmm. But you know what's really bad is that they're now starting to see physical effects on these people in airplanes when the planes are flying at 20,000 feet, which is where most planes fly. So we've gotten enough pollutants in the upper atmosphere that what's happening in the upper atmosphere is toxic to things that are up there, including birds. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Because my cousin just died and he was a flight attendant and he died from <coughs> cancer of the kidneys. Could okay. you just say a little bit more? Because I want to shoot this to my uncle. Well, what is happening when you get up into the upper atmosphere is that the concentration of metals, which act as catalysts for organic and inorganic chemical reactions, is up at the similar concentration to the materials that become the products and reactants. The fact that you don't have the cloud cover and the other things to interfere and slow down the reactions means that once you're up at that height where you're just breathing in the particulate and it is in the form of a catalyst, it's just going to cause more chemical reactions within your body Cancer is unlimited growth via the increase in the rate of your metabolic chemical reactions. So if you've got a cancer, what that means is that some part of you is growing more of you than you would normally grow. Except some of us who are guys who have big guts. Yeah, yes. the barium is especially known to be causing all the kidney disease, so one of my three is yeah. a factor that. Yeah, one of the things about a lot of these ions, if you think about the way chemistry works, the periodic table is this chart that puts columns together of elements that are similar in the configuration of chemistry structure as you move down the column. So lithium, sodium, potassium are all in one column, and the column next to them are magnesium, calcium, barium, and strontium. Mm -hmm. And then as you move over to the right, you get similarities between the up and down, so that <coughs> moving left to right, you get different properties, but moving up and down, you get the same properties, only as you move down the chemistry table, things get bigger in size, just because there's more protons, more neutrons, more mass to deal with but the chemistry acts the same. In biological systems, what you have 
or you have active sites that are made to be specific fits for the right metal ion, and a nickel metal ion has a completely different site requirement than an iron metal ion, even though they're next to the, each other in the periodic table. Whereas iron does certain things like transfers oxygen and hemoglobin. Molybdenum, which is underneath iron, has similar properties and it can actually break into nitrogen, the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond, which is one of the toughest things to break into. And molybdenum does it in a way that it allows beans to fix nitrogen and grow more rapidly and bigger than they would otherwise do. That was shortcut number one. Shortcut number two, all the delays has caused more melting of the Arctic and Antarctic ice, which is releasing metal hydrate. And for any melting ice that was on land and not on water, it will cause an increase in the level of sea level. If the ice is already on the water in the form of an iceberg, the weight of the ice displaces the water in the ocean already. But if it's on land and it's not displacing water, that melt is what's going to increase the level of the seawater. Um, the increase in concentration of methane being 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide it means that we haven't been able to control what we're putting in the air. And so the more stuff that we're putting in the air that can react with itself in oxidation reduction reactions, those sort of reactions change the composition of the chemicals and more times than not, they leave something in a state that's more toxic as opposed to less toxic. Um, the times come where the special interests have gotten enough advertising and information out that it has really blurred the, the argument in the whole game. And, well, there's some ignorance, there's some dumb choices made, and there's some real resident evil in the system that takes things away. Uh, they used to have an electric car that GM produced, uh, the EV1, and not only did they recall it, they crushed every single one because a car with an 80 mile range that didn't need gas wasn't going to be economically viable for the system. Yes, Lucretia. And then, um, rising sea levels and primary water, because we have secondary water that comes from the rain, the primary water, which all the sites we have a forward in the book, um, that is generated sometimes at 6,000 gallons a minute out of solid granite coming from the earth is the hydrogen and oxygen mix. You know, that's great water that's coming up that's also filling the oceans. What is maybe separating the water that's on the earth can maybe go go back down into the earth to create just hydrogen and oxygen? To tell you the truth, there are metal catalysts that will separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. And if there is electrical discharge, that will create radicals that will allow things to happen in a much more efficient manner. One of the major problems that we have with our underground aquifers is fracking. And the fact that they have used high pressure water to push oil around under the ground into places where the oil could not seep into has put oil into water in places that should have been pure water sources for quite a long time. The other thing is that the production of oil within the earth is an adiabatic continuous process and as long as we're pumping oil out of the earth, we're going to drive the equilibrium of that reaction for the earth to make more oil. 
the reason that the earth makes oil is for lubrication of the tectonic plates so that when they shift over each other, it glides. When that doesn't happen, what do we get? Earthquakes. Well, Chris, you want to talk about some new earthquakes that yeah, just happened? Yeah, I cut off on Kingo today. Um, Tuesday I saw all the chemtrails and I especially saw crosses over Mount Ashland, which when you're looking at Mount Ashland from um, Ashland, you're basically looking at Humboldt and Bayview, California. And I see these chemtrails and then I see a big greasy big ring around the sun. Then I see yellow and pink, you know, in that greasy ring in those spots and you can see some heart frequencies. And um, if anybody ever saw the, the earthquake in China, when that went off, there was weird little pink and yellow clouds. Well, I saw pink and yellow, yellow clouds, and I saw all these, like, it was really strange. Like, the, the, the mountain comes like this, but right in this one little gap, all these clouds are bubbles. So, you know, it was just like this, very pushed out and low. It wasn't like the clouds went up over the, the, the mountains. It's just right there. And sure enough, I looked up last night, there was a 3.1 in, in the New California. So you can see they were doing the frequencies. When I was on uh, Bill Meyer this morning, he said, well, that's not a, I said, it was heart like frequencies. He said, well, the heart's been shut down. And I said, well, the next ride. He said, the next ride, that's a, a observatory, a, you know, weather observatory. It's like, no, next ride puts out frequencies to ping the clouds to see how much water is in them. Well, if you, when Nick Baggage comes on the 19th, or if you just go online and, and look at his book, it has a, a, a forward at the very beginning he talks about all the patents based on frequencies, low level frequencies to modulate the weather. And there's certain frequencies the Russians know are forget which country um, that is really good for your brain and other ones that are really bad. And they they literally Russia hit Eugene Oregon with frequencies cause a lot of people go into the hospital, a lot of people commit suicide. Okay. So they know all this and we're being that is a mix right up on that ash. And that unit is also being, they're all over the place, but to put out frequencies. So they definitely, I have no doubt, caused that earthquake yesterday. Yeah. They're moving that whole plane. So what we've got is we've got the whole field of geoengineering, which is out there using the facets of <laughs> chemistry to change how the Earth climate systems work. And what they're really doing is changing the medical, metabolic processes of the Earth, which I believe is a living system, and all the subsystems that are on the surface of the planet. And why they're doing it? Well, that's a good question. Um, my friend Carol Rosen, who works on space treaties, to keep war out of space has suggested that we get together and see if we can't make a geoengineering treaty that limits the amount of geoengineering that countries can do. And it sounds like a reasonable idea. But as long as we have people who can do what they want with impunity, and don't care about the life on Earth that we are trying to support with all of our endeavors, we're not going to be able to really address these problems effectively. Well, there's one more thing I want to bring up and then we'll take a break and I'll talk about solutions. That is what I mentioned earlier when I said about the ozone hole and talking about things. And ozone has been presented to us as an upper atmosphere protecting agent. But when I start thinking about what ozone is, it's something called a free radical generator. And a free radical is a chemistry particle that has a single unpaired electron. For those of you who are not chemists and don't know how the game works, that's a big no-no in chemistry. Chemistry electrons travel in pairs of two, and a single chemistry orbital can collect two electrons. And when something has only one electron, 
what it does is it tries to steal an electron from some other place. And so free radicals work like ozone. It works by taking the O3 molecule and making O2 normal oxygen and O dot the radical. And O dot the radical runs into something and says, aha, I'll steal an electron. And when it steals an electron, it's not a radical, but what it stole the electron from is a radical. And it runs around to steal an electron. And these radicals run all over the place, stealing electrons from each other until two radicals come together and they share the electrons and the game ends. So instead of an ozone layer as protection, which creates free radicals, as a chemist, I wonder if the ozone story is that the ozone is the artificial chemical and that it's causing the problems rather than really helping the problems. And it seems to me that nature tries to inhibit free radical generation, not create substances that create free radical generation. So I just wanted to point that out as part of the chemistry. Except for in us, I mean, it's incredible for um, just killing the bad guys and keeping the good guys. So I don't know, it seems like humans and, and other things will have the antioxidants uh, to, you know, to protect the cells, have them, but the bugs don't. And so maybe that's... Well, maybe antioxidants are things that prevent oxidation. Right, but, so, but our cells can take it, and, and it's really good to do ozone insulation and direct it, you know, pump it into you. I mean, I had it in my hip, and it just totally regenerated my oh, my cartilage. Yeah, cell. what it does is it reacts with everything that shouldn't be there. Gets everything right. that's off. Yeah, gets it to the point where nothing that shouldn't be there is left. And then there's nothing for the free radical to continue to eat. It dies off by running into another free radical. And all that's left is good structure to begin growing again. It's not that ozone is evil. It's that generating free radicals in the upper atmosphere seems to me as a chemist to be counterproductive.